Okay, so we are here in chapter six. Chapter six is about normal probability distributions. So we looked at probability distributions in chapter five, and now we are looking at normal probability distributions. And we are currently going to take a look today at 6.2. So just looking over the chapter, it's a longer chapter than most of our chapters. However, the last section 6.6, .6, we are not going to cover that in this class. So that has not been built into any of the homework or quiz assignments. It won't be on the midterms or final or anything like that. Uh, it's an optional section that we're not gonna cover. Uh, but we are gonna cover sections one through five. And I talked about section one earlier. So now we're gonna take a look at 6.2, real applications of normal distributions. Key concept. This section presents methods for working with normal distributions that are not standard. That is, the mean is not zero or the standard deviation is not one or both. So they're specifying that because in 6.1, we introduce the idea of a standard normal distribution. And in 6.2, we're going to extend that work to non-standard normal distributions. So it'll still be a normal distribution, but it won't be standard. And when it's not standard, that means that the mean is not zero and or the standard deviation is not one, which is what occurs most frequently in the real world. But what we're going to do is we're gonna do the same things we were doing in 6.1, but we're just going to modify things a little bit when we're working with a non normal, a non-standard normal distribution. The key is we can use a simple conversion that allows us to standardize any normal distribution so that the same methods from the previous section can be used. So they have this conversion formula and you may recognize this as something where we're just getting a z-score, which I think was introduced in the previous chapter, or maybe even chapter three. So um, we won't need to use this z-score too frequently um, because the tools we have at StatCrunch kind of helps us avoid using this formula, but it's not that hard to use. And we definitely wanna know what a z-score is and what it means when you assign a z-score to a data value. And this formula helps us to see that. The formula allows us to standardize any normal distribution so that x values can be transformed to z-scores. And remember, x values are data values from some data set, either from a population or from a statistic or a sample. So what this does is they, they calculate the difference. This is the difference between X and mu. And remember, mu is the mean for the population. So they're saying, how far is the data value that you're looking at? How far away from that is the average data value or the mean data value? How far away is that? If the, the mean height for a population is five foot seven, and you're looking at somebody who's five foot 10, well, then there would be a three inch difference there. The difference between the person you're looking at and the mean value would be three inches. Well, that's what's calculated in the top of the fraction. And then you divide that by the standard deviation. And so the result is how many standard deviations the data value is away from the mean. For example, if my person I was looking at was three inches higher than the mean and the standard deviation was one and a half inches, then three inches divided by one and a half inches would give me a Z score of two. And that would tell me that the person who is five foot 10, who's three inches above the mean, that there are two standard deviations above the mean. And that helps me understand how far they are in terms of rarity, in terms of scarcity. We will see this in action. So 
So they do a little diagram and they introduced, and we'll use these diagrams a lot when working with normal distributions. They introduce them uh, and use them regularly in the last section. And basically, when you have a normal distribution, there's some mean value in the middle, like five foot seven. There's some particular data value, X. Well, for a standard normal distribution, the mean is zero and the z-score is the score you work with. And so we're going to translate the scores of the actual data values for a regular non-standard normal distribution into z-scores on a normal distribution because then we can use a normal calculator to determine probabilities and things like that. We'll have to see this in action to understand this more fill more formally. But they're kind of showing what this formula does. The formula translates an x value into a z-score so that you can think about being on a standard normal distribution um, when you're doing calculations. So they give a procedure and it involves finding areas with non-standard normal distributions. So it's designed for you to do it basically using a table or a calculator that can't adjust the z-score for you, but StatCrunch can. So I'm gonna kind of go over this, skip over this because I think it'll be much simpler if I illustrate this procedure in StatCrunch because a couple of the steps aren't necessary and also you'll be able to sort of see it while we have a specific example. But uh, this slide is here and sometimes it's helpful but I'm gonna skip it for now. And we're gonna look at our first example, which has six slides to illustrate it. It says, what proportion of men are taller than the 72 inch height requirement for shower heads? Heights of men are normally distributed with a mean of 68.6 inches. Uh, that's interesting. So that's five foot eight and a half, basically, is the average or mean height of men. And a standard deviation of 2.8 inches. Find the percentage of men who are taller than a shower head at 72 inches. So they're imagining that a shower head is installed and it's 72 inches off the ground how many men might run the risk of bumping into that shower head because they're taller than that 72 inches. And we wanna know the percentage of men who are in that range of height, bigger than 72 inches. So let's pause here with the statement of the problem. And they're going to do it for us, but some of you may not have even have looked at 6.1 yet. And so what they're doing is they think you've already done 6.1. So I'm probably going to do this from scratch for us here, or at least talk about it. But before I begin, are there any questions about the statement of the problem, what they're asking for, or anything like that before I demonstrate for you? So I, I think this is great. And I was just discussing the idea of using heights, people's heights, uh, when talking about a normal distribution. So this is right in line with the example I was just giving. So when they say heights of men are normally distributed, that means that we immediately can envision this curve, a normal curve with sort of a bell shape that's symmetric and in the middle is the mean. And then they told us that the mean is 68.6 inches. So I can imagine that the center of this distribution is 68.6 inches. And they also told us that the standard deviation is 2.8. So that's sigma is equal to 2.8 inches. So then they ask us from that little bit of information to find the percentage of men who are taller than a shower head at 72 inches. So um, again, the horizontal axis on the bottom here is measuring out how, how many inches, how tall somebody is in inches. So since 68.6 is right there in the middle, 72 would be over there somewhere to the right of that. 
And when they ask us the percentage of men who are taller than this shower head, then this picture distribution shows where all of the data is, shows where all the people's heights would be. And to see which percentage are larger or taller than 72 inches, we would be basically asking how much of this distribution is over here, is to the right of the 72 inches. So the percentage of men who are taller than 72 inches will be the same as the portion of the area under the distribution curve here shaded to the right of 72 inches. And that's what we are tasked to calculate. All right, so how do we do that? Well, we don't do that with the formula. We are just going to use technology. Um, now, the process that they gave us, the little procedure, would be to convert that 72 inches x value into a z-score and then look up the z-score on a table where the table might tell us the area. Uh, but we're going to avoid all of that and just do this in StatCrunch. And I'm going to illustrate that after we go through the slides. So I'm pointing that out because as usual, it's possible the slides are going to go and show us procedurally as they do problems as an example, stuff that we won't need to do ourselves. And I think this is going to be one of those cases. So I've kind of shown you what you need to understand from the problem. And then at this point, as I've been demonstrating, I would then open StatCrunch to do the problem. So if you can understand things up to this point, you put yourself in a position where you can then do homework problems using StatCrunch. But let's see how they approach the problem and what they show you in the next five slides. So they start by making the graph that I was making. And they're already showing us the answer here because they basically just used one graphic to show everything all at once and they just repeat it. Um, so they have this, they came up with this answer here. But how we come up with that answer is probably the thing we want to be get more comfortable with. So it says for the solution in step one, they're saying that because men have normally distributed height with the mean and standard deviations given, the shaded region represents the men who are taller than the shower head height of 72 inches. And boom, the whole picture is drawn there. So just from their step one, they're basically saying, draw this picture. And we can see, how does that compare to the picture that I drew up here? And when I was discussing that, whether that makes sense. And of course, if you have questions, shout them out. Now, what they've gone a little further in this picture is they're showing below the actual values given in the problem, the z-score for 72 inches in green and the area that they got. So they're going to show the, how they did that in the next couple slides. But we're going to get that area from StatCrunch, and we won't need to use z-scores for our procedure. All right, so on slide three, they do step two. They get that z-score by using the little formula. They say, well, how far apart is the value 72 from the mean? They get that difference on the top here. As we were discussing before. And then they divide that by the size of a standard deviation, which is 2.8 inches. And if you take how many inches the x value is away from the mean and divide that by the measurement stick of 2.8 inches for a standard deviation, then the z-score of 1.21 tells you that a height of 72 inches is 1.21 standard deviations above the mean. That's how extreme that value is. And that's how we can get an idea of how far you would be on the right in that normal graph, and therefore how much area is left bigger than the value of 72. So there's the little formula application. Again, StatCrunch won't require that. So then it says, well, now that we know the z-score, you can use technology to find the area to the right of 72 inches and that they got 
0.23 or a little bit more than 11% of the area is to the right of 72 inches. So it says with many technologies, step two can be skipped. Stat crunch is one of those technologies where step two can be skipped. The result of 11% from technology is more accurate than the result on the table. They do show how to do things by looking them up on a table as kind of a throwback to the time when technology wasn't so easily available to everybody. Um, and so they recommend in section one that you use technology instead of the table, but they still show you how to do it in the table for those who wish to see how to do that. All right, so here they're talking about how they would do it on the table, so I'm going to skip that. It's more work and it's harder and we don't need to do it, but it's there if you want to reference it. And then they interpret their answer. The proportion of men taller than 72 inches is 0.1123 or 11.23%. So about 11% of men may find the design to be unsuitable because their head will be higher than the, uh, the placement of the shower head at 72 inches. Questions, comments, discussions about that at all? I have a question actually. So when you're calculating all of this data, does it does it always have to be based on a population set of data or can it be from a sample set? So, uh, it, so it depends what the goal of your problem is. So in general, we're usually in statistics talking about a large population and we're using a sample to try to infer or make inferences about the large population. So right now they're talking about the entire population and they use the mu symbol for the mean to represent that's the mean for the entire population and they used sigma, which is for the entire population, not for a sample. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, what's gonna happen is as we move forward, starting next chapter in chapter seven and then for the rest of the semester, we take on this issue about, well, when I'm only looking at 100 people, what kind of conclusions can I draw about the 10,000 people in my population that I drew those 100 people from? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I was just wondering if, you know, if what one was more accurate than the other. Well, definitely, if you know the standard deviation and the mean value for the entire population, well, then you can make very accurate predictions about um, what portion of that population will be above or below a certain value. But the problem is, is remember that to get the mean or the standard deviation, you have to use every data value in the entire population. And that's what's not practical. So that's why we end up taking samples and hope that our samples are similar enough to the overall population that we can draw similar conclusions. But because we do have randomness in which sample we happen to get, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And those complications are the discussion and topics that we're going to begin to cover uh, in the, over the, this chapter and the coming chapters. Okay. Other questions at all while we're thinking about it here at this point? So professor, I've been working in my homework um, and um, because I didn't know how to use technology, I didn't know how to use like start crunch to like solve these problems. I was focusing or basing more on the table. Mm -hmm. um, it worked for me, but I don't know like, um, if you can, for example, maybe at the end of the class or like at, during the class, can you can you show us an example of how to use StatCrunch to solve these problems instead of like focusing on the table? Absolutely. Yeah, so two things. Uh, I typically do that every time we do an introduction like this is I try to save five to 10 minutes at the end of the, of the slide presentation. I stop doing the slides and we hop over to StatCrunch, uh, hop over to my Stat Lab, so I can illustrate how this looks when you're doing it on your homework using StatCrunch. And then secondly, I will be posting videos for how to use all the tools in StatCrunch for this chapter's problems by the end of the day today. 
as I was uh, illustrating there in the canvas. Does that, okay. you satisfied with that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, so as we go through the slides, it's a little too hard because I'm typically using slides on a different device than I do when I'm sharing my screen to do homework problems. And so it's hard to go quickly back and forth between the two. So I'll usually finish the slide show while I keep alluding to the idea that you're going to do stat crunch for this part. So don't worry about this formula. Don't worry about using the tables. But definitely after the slideshow, uh, I'll save time to also demonstrate in stat crunch. OK, so they just did an example. So this was an example where we were told the standard deviation and the mean value. And then we were asked to find an area or a probability or a portion of the population above a certain value, in this case, 72 inches. So for the next step, they're going to say, well, we could go the other way. Let's say you want to find what value would have a certain area. So instead of being given 72 inches and finding out 11% of people are taller than that, what if I said, how tall do you have to be to be in the top 5% of how tall people are? So then I'm telling you that the area shaded above the value is 5%, but I don't know what the value is. So now they're saying, we're going to look at finding values from known areas. Here are helpful hints for those cases in which the area or probability or percentage is known, and we want to find the relevant value. And they're going to discuss that. So let me just look at the example we just did. Let's say people are going to put their shower head in there, and they found out, well, 72 inches is a nice height, because that's like six feet. That's very easy to measure. But we found that if we put it there, there's 11% of the population that are still going to bonk their head on that, at least for the men. So let's say they decide that they're going to make it higher than that. And they want to say, well, how high do we need to make it so that we're making it tall enough and that we're only going to have maybe 2% of people be so tall that they're going to hit it? So then they could turn the question around and say, well, if 72 inches there's 11% of the people that might hit their head. How high do I need to make it so that only 2% of the people would hit their head? And so that would be reversing the order in which we know the probability of the percentage. And then we're trying to come up with the right score, the right height to have only 2% or only 2% be shaded. So that's why the problem may in the real world be the other way around. And now they're gonna talk about how to do that. Graphs are extremely helpful in visualizing, understanding, and successfully working with normal prob um, that's supposed to say probability distributions. So they should always be used. Don't confuse z-scores and areas. Z-scores are the distances along the horizontal axis in standard deviations. Areas are the portion of the graph to the right or to the left or between a couple of z-scores. Keep in mind, z-scores can be like a 1 or a 2 or negative 1 or negative 2, where probabilities or areas under a probability distribution are always values between 0 and 1. So that might help keep it straight between the two. And then it says to choose the correct left or right side of the graph. Like, for example, if I want to be above 72 inches, I would be to the right of that number. If I wanted to know how many people are less than 72 inches, that would be to the left of that number. That usually becomes clear when you're doing problems if you're doing what they said in number one, which is using a graph. So they give you a procedure. The procedure here also has a step referring to tables and things like that. So I'm actually going to skip it because it's better if we just demonstrate it. We're not going to do stuff this way necessarily. And then they have another example with seven slides in it to illustrate this direction. And this will actually then finish up the slide set. So let's try to go through this example answer any questions while they're doing it for us. And then we will have on this rare instance actually completed all the slides. There was only 24. Um, and then we'll hop over into my stat lab and do a problem in stat crunch. 
So here's our final example for this uh, slideshow. When designing equipment, one common criterion is to use a design that accommodates 95% of the population. So for example, in our shower head placement, once you found that 72 inches, 11% of the people were too tall for that and therefore 89% of the people were okay with it. To get to the 95% level, we'd wanna raise the shower head to the point where only 5% of the people were taller than that and 95% of the people were okay with that shower head height as an example. So we have seen that only 46% of women satisfy the height requirements for US Air Force pilots. This was in earlier examples. What would be the maximum acceptable height of a woman if the requirements were changed to allow the shortest 95% of women to be pilots? That is, find the 95th percentile of heights of women. In other words, what height for women is the height where 95% of women are shorter than that and 5% of women are taller than that? And it gives us some information. It says, assume the heights of, of women are normally distributed with a mean of 63.7 and a standard deviation of 2.9 inches. And then they have a follow-up question in addition to the maximum allowable height, should there also be a minimum required height? If not, why? If so, why? So they're going to proceed now to solve this problem. So notice what is similar about the one we just did. The one we just did, they also gave us the mean height for the men and the standard deviation for men but then they gave us an individual height example of 72 inches and asked us to see what percentage that was on the scheme of things high to low. Now they're giving us the mean of the women and the standard deviation of the women but now they're giving us the percentage and asking us what the height is. So they've reversed which thing they want to find. Kind of vice versa. Vice versa. All right, so let's look at their solution. As they said in step one, they're starting by making a graph to help visualize what's going on. And they've actually done the whole problem here because they just made one graph and then they just keep repeating it. But the key part of the graph they made is that we know we have a normal distribution. They told us what the mean was, so they included the mean here. And then they told us the standard deviation, but that's not drawn or shown in the graph. The standard deviation was 2.9 inches, I believe. And the mean value was 63.7 inches. So the idea is how many standard deviations above the mean do I need to go in order to get to the point where I've shaded or trapped or 95% of the values are below there. So they're indicating that here, meaning we want this shaded region to be 95%. So if you were using the table, you would literally use the table backwards and find the correct amount of area and go back and look up a z-score but that's not a very friendly process at all. And StatCrunch will make this very easy for us. They're also showing the Z-score that you would need to trap that part of the area, which could be looked up or using technology. But again, with StatCrunch, we won't even need to know what the Z-score was in the middle. They make it very easy for us for the tool that they have. So they're showing as an example using technology, what is that? mini tab, I think, or something. Um, and so they're saying, well, what we did in technology is we put in, we put in the mean value, the standard deviation, and then they told us what height was needed. And if you were using the table, you would do a bunch of extra work, which we're now going to ignore. So with the table or with technology, they came up with the fact that 
Oh, they don't have it here. They came up with the Z score that's needed, but then they're translating that using some steps that we don't need to translate as well to come up with this height. And when they came up with that height, then they can draw their conclusion that at 68.5 inches, that's greater than the mean of 63.7. And at that height, 68.5 rounded off to one decimal, you know that 85% uh, of the heights of women are below that height. So if they set that as their maximum height, then they are allowing 95% of the women to still participate in the pilot program. So a requirement of a height less than 85.8, uh, sorry, 68.5 inches would allow 95% of women to be eligible. And there should be a minimum height requirement so that the pilot can easily reach all the controls. Try to keep us in mind that this is a real world situation. All right, so I'm gonna hop over and show how StatCrunch will allow us to do these calculations. Before I leave the slides, are there any questions about any part of the slideshow you'd like me to elaborate on or look at again, or do you have a question about? Okay, so they did two things. They demonstrated how given the standard deviation and mean for a population, then if you know a particular value from that population, you can say what percentage of the population is larger or smaller than that value because you know how they're distributed on a normal distribution. Or vice versa to that, if you know the mean and standard deviation of a population, then you can produce a value from the population that would have a certain percentage below or above that particular value because you know how they're distributed on a normal distribution. All right, so let's go away from the slideshow and see how we might be able to do this in StatCrunch. So if I hop over to homework, so this is homework number seven on the first three sections of chapter six. I think I found to get into 6.2, you had to go all the way up around 26 or 28, maybe 26, let's see. Yeah, this looks good. Okay, so I'm looking at problem number 26. And as we can see, this is from 6.2 and it does have a T on it, meaning they're expecting you're going to use technology. And the statement of the problem is really nice and simple. It's not overly complicated. Let me shrink this box down a little bit. So it says, find the area of the shaded region. The graph to the right depicts IQ scores of adults. Those scores are normally distributed. That means we would have this bell-shaped curve for a distribution, probability distribution with a mean of 100, so that means the dead center mean would be 100, and a standard deviation of 15. So they're giving us uh, from the population the mean and the standard deviation, and they're asking us what portion of the population would be above a certain value, which means what area is in here. So the process they outlined in the slides and they discuss in the book would be to determine the z-score of this value using that little formula and then looking up the z-score on the table or some technologies. But we can actually just go directly to StatCrunch and do this problem in StatCrunch using their tool. So let me show you how to do that. I would go to question help to open StatCrunch. Notice there is a, a worked example you could see here, but again, the worked example won't show StatCrunch. I'm gonna say open StatCrunch. It's a little bit more window than I think I need. Okay, so then what we wanna do is we wanna calculate this area. And so we want a calculator tool that's designed for normal distributions. So to find that we go to stat calculators normal. 
And this is the exact same tool that I illustrated to do problems in 6.1 as well. So same exact tool for both sections. So when I click on that, it brings up this calculator. And the nice thing is the calculator has built into it the graph. So we can immediately be thinking about this graphically, which is the best way to do these problems. And by default, it's set with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. When the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one, that's a standard normal distribution, which is what they discussed in 6.1. But when the mean is different, like in this case, it's 100 and or the standard deviation is different, as in this case, it's 15, well, then that's a non-standard but still normal distribution. So we still use the normal calculator. But we can change this. I can say, oh, the mean in my problem is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. And then it will accommodate the values for this problem. So then to get the area to the right of 92, I say, I don't want x values to the left of a number. I want x values to the right of a number. And I don't want to be to the right of 0. I want to be to the right of 92. And then it will tell me the probability that a randomly chosen x value will end up being greater than or equal to 92. And that will be the same as the portion of the population that has an IQ score larger than 92. And I hit compute. And when I do that, it'll adjust the graph. It should look like the graph that they're showing us here if things are set up correctly. Like if you see they shaded to the right and you forgot to change this and you were shaded to the left, then you can just go back and fix that and shade to the right. And then the result after I filled in these things is sitting right here. So it's telling me that the area in the graph, which is corresponds to the probability of a randomly selected person being in this range, or the portion of the population that's in this range, is basically a little bit more than 70%. I'm supposed to do this to four decimals. So if I grab this number to four decimals, it looks like that. And the zero on the end is followed by a nine. So I need to round it up to a one. So I drop it over here, back over to zero, put in a one, and check the answer. So how do you guys feel about that? Are you satisfied? Is there questions? There was a question about how to do this in StatCrunch, so I'm now showing that. So let's make sure people are satisfied by this. So Xavier's happy with that, that's good. Uh, can you just repeat again, like how did you um, started it in Start Crunch? Um, I just missed that part. I just like I I um, I knew how to get like the mean and the standard devi deviation, but uh, I would like to know, yeah, how to start. So go to the Stat tab, and you go Calculators, Normal. Okay, thank and then you. It will bring up this tool with the default settings and then you enter the settings for the problem that you want to do. Okay, thanks. Any other questions while we've got this problem up on the screen and we're looking at it? We've got time to take a look at one or two more. Now, so this was how they started the section where they gave us a particular value and ask us what portion was in a particular direction. But then the second long example they did in the slides was where they would tell us the amount of area and ask us what value we would get. So if I was doing a problem that way and we'll try to find one next, I would leave the actual score blank and I would fill in the area and hit compute and then it'll go back and give us the score that we need. Let's see if uh, that's quick to find. Okay, well, this is a good one. So here, instead of giving us just one score, they gave us two and they wanna know what portion of the population or what's the probability that a randomly chosen person would fall between these two scores. And this is where StatCrunch really shines because a lot of the calculator tools and TIs and things like that, they can't do this. It all of a sudden makes it a multi-step problem. But here, I just switched the calculator over to the between setting. And now it gives us two different scores to enter. I still have the mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. So I would say my lower score is 108 
and my upper score is 128 and I hit compute and it tells me what portion is in that range. To four decimals, it's like I get to leave that number alone, don't have to round up. So this tool is going to make some of these problems go really fast for you. These are going to be problems, hopefully, that on midterm two, you can't wait to see these because they're like 20 second problems. You just grab the calculator, put in the mean standard deviation in the number range, and there's your answer. And that's the whole problem and you're done. All right, so now let's look at, uh, I've moved on to number 28 here, and I'm gonna go back to the standard version of this. So they're still dealing, dealing with IQ scores with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, but now they've switched it on us. They've reversed the order, vice versa. What they're now doing is telling us not what the score is and how much area is the question, but they're telling us how much the area is and what the score is, is the question. They've simply reversed the two. So I would leave everything the way it is, but I would now put in the new area that is allowed 0 0.2743. And now notice that when I've changed the area, the score is now become blank. And when I hit compute, it'll tell me the score I need to have that much area to the right. And so that's supposed to be rounded to the nearest whole number. So that looks like it should be 109. So uh, notice I didn't actually need to get a Z score. I didn't need to convert to Z scores. With the StatCrunch calculator, you can just work with the scores themselves. You can work with the actual heights or with the IQ scores or whatever it is that's being measured in the sample. So here we did an example where we were given the area and then we produced what score was needed to have that amount of area. Questions about that at all? Yeah, could you do that last problem um, again or just show your steps, the one previous to this? Oh, the one before this one? Yeah. This one here? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go similar question and let's just start it from scratch as if we hadn't done anything. It says find the area of the shaded region and you can see that the region that is shaded is between two numbers. It says the graph to the right depicts IQ scores of adults and those scores are normally distributed. That's why this graph has this nice bell-shaped curve. But the normal distribution has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So to determine what portion of the population is in a certain range, when you know the mean and standard deviation, we use a normal calculator. So I would go to stat, calculators, normal. Now for this problem, I'm not asked to have a particular value and be to the right or to the left. I'm asked for the area between two. So it starts on the standard, but I'm gonna select between instead. So now it's giving me a between normal distribution calculator, but the mean and the standard deviation, which by default are set to zero and one, I need to adjust because in my problem, the mean is hundred. So I'm gonna put that in and the standard deviation is 15, because that's the way it is for IQ scores. Now, the way I find the portion or probability between these two values is in where it says probability and the X value, it gives me two places, something that's bigger than X, something that's less than X, and then X will be between those. So I put the lower value on the left here of 108 and the higher value on the right of 128. So now when a population has a mean of 100, a standard deviation of 15, then the portion of the population that's between 108 and 128, I can get by computing and seeing that that's like almost 27%. Then the graph should match the picture and it gives me the answer I want here. To four decimals, I'm assuming. And then I fill that in check. Are you satisfied by that or do you have a follow-up question? 
Oh, no, you answered it nicely, too. OK, and as you can see, even with my descriptions, it took less than a minute. What, it's about understanding what they're doing and understanding which tool will help you do that. And if you can get to that point, the problems will not be time consuming. So that means where you want to spend your time is trying to understand what's going on. So try not to just copy what you see me doing or what a video shows you to do. Use the time to understand what's going on and that'll make things better, I think. There's a, request, a question about number 31. So let's see if we can take a look at there. We got a couple of minutes left. 31. All right, so it says, assume that adults have IQ scores normally distributed. Uh, but in this case, it says with a mean of 103.2 and a standard deviation of 19.2, find the first quartile, which is the IQ score separating the bottom 25% from the top 75%. So they're reminding us what the first quartile is because by now we might start to forget those things, but that's good, refresh our memory. So we want to know what score would have the area to the left 25% and or the area to the right 75%. So I'm going to go back to the standard calculator. Let's put in the correct uh, new scores here, 103.2 and a standard deviation of 19.2. And I want to find places where the score, uh, uh, the area is, uh, less than the value of the area is 25%, which is 0.25. So let me pause there and then I'll hit compute. So Mila asked about this. Mila, do you see how I'm entering these things in the calculator from the problem? Yeah. Any questions about how I chose to do that or why that makes sense? Anything there that's confusing? No, it makes sense. Okay. So it says to have the 25% to the left, therefore 75% to the right, the score that I need that'll accomplish that is 90 point something. And it says to round to one decimal place. So that would look like it's 90.2. And that's the first quartile. 